Hello everyone, I am Zabala Pumetao. Hello everybody, I'm Daurat Khawahi. We are here to talk to you about dealing with legacy code in closure. But no, this is just a fake title so we could pretend this presentation was more serious than it really is. We are here actually to tell you our story. So the story is, once upon a time, somewhere in the universe, there were a planet called Lubick. And on that planet, lived some different kind of creatures, and some of those creatures were called engineers. And the role of the engineers were to build some little cute monster that they also called microservices in order to provide better life quality to the planet habitants. So like any social organizations, the social groups, they needed to be organized. They needed to divide the engineers in, according to the area of activities. So the little cute monster, the microservice they were about to build will be related to those domains. But it happens that there were some monsters that didn't fit really well with the squads they were in. I mean, they had a specific task, a specific job, but the job wasn't related with the mission of their squad. So, for example, we had this orange monster called Notification, which is the service responsible for sending emails and pushes to our customers. It was in the customer acquisition squad, which the squad responsible for all the process of acquiring new customers to Nubank. I mean, sending emails isn't that related with customer acquisition. It's a domain that every other squad in Nubank needs. So, it happens that the engineers of these squads couldn't give a notification that much attention because they needed to prioritize the monsters that would help them to accomplish their mission as a customer acquisition squad. The same happened with Tempo, the scheduling monster, Mortician, the dead letter handling monster, and Scary Break, the routing monster. All of them were abandoned by their squads. Because of this, they started getting a little unstable very aggressive and very, very, very angry. They started spreading the chaos on the planet. Firefights were constant, but there were no one really able to stop them because no one understood how they worked. It was when a software engineer decided to assemble a group that would take the mission of facing these monsters. The group started small, but it grew, and they swear to accomplish this mission of adopting these monsters and giving them the attention they always wanted in order to make them stable again and insert them in society again. This is our story and the real title of this presentation, A View from the Trenches. So chapter one, the adoption. So the adoption process. In the adoption process, we wanted to know better those little monsters. In order to be able to help them to bring them back to stability, we needed to, we had a lot of questions and we know we needed some, some answers to be able to help those little monsters. I mean, we wanted to know, you know, stuff related to those monsters. And we decided to talk to the former owners you know, because they were, they were the ones who were taking care of those monsters. But I think it will be interesting to say that sometimes the former owner is not the creator of the little monster. It's just heritage that little monster is taking care of him, but it's not, the, it's not that those, little, those former owners who created that little monster. I mean, they have sometimes a part of the knowledge about that monster, but not the whole big picture. Sometimes that happened. So, so in the meeting with the former owners, we asked them a lot of questions and they provide us some very, very valuable information, like why those monsters have been created, what they do, is there any kind of thing that we should know about them? I mean, every house has is secret. There is something that you shouldn't do because if you do that, the little monster is going to freak up and start, you know, spreading the curls like he's a say before. So you need to know them be a, a, a lot. So they provide us a lot of information and also the most important, they gave us some set of artifacts that were going to help us in our journey of adoption. So the first of them was metrics. And alerts. Good and backlog. And problems. Good luck. And Egba, everything gonna be all right. Yeah, they have this a lot. They give us a lot of information, but would all this information be enough for us to face these monsters? We decided that not. In order to make these monsters respect us, we needed to know them deeply, how they worked. We needed to spend some time with them. We need to do some tasks with them. It was time to act. 
Chapter two, hands up. See, I have a friend that uses to say that closure is a one time only language. I mean, you write the code, but no one will ever be able to read it again. This is not true. We are here to prove it to you. And we'll take as an example the notification service, the little monster that sends emails and pushes to our customers. I mean, it was not a legacy service because, in the sense of it doesn't have tests, because Nubank has a very strong test culture, so it did have tests. But it is an old service, like it was one of the first of Nubank. And it was, in fact, a little bit dusty because, as I said before, no one really took care of it. And it was our mission to make notification happy again. So here we show you some points we act in order to accomplish this mission in how to make this monster more happy and stable. So the first case we're going to share with you here is about the refactoring case. I mean, we are about to, to adapt some services and we, know, we need to know how the services work. I mean, we, want, we need to know how the code is right. We need to perform some tests, some refactoring in order to know how things work under the wood. So the first case I want to bring to you here is about the delivery function. Delivery function takes some inputs and get the template. From that template, you prepare an email and then send it. And after sending it, you just press it that email. So, so good so far. But this function end up with uh, start smaller and then after that get bigger. This is normal because we are dealing here with the business and the business grow. And also the function the code we write to deal with those business have to grow also. So here, when you go through the function, you can see that. In the first, if you can, we can, we can assume that they were facing some inefficiency issues, so they decided to put some checking there in order to prevent uh, sending an email twice, or something like that. And the second one, if you can say that they want to check if they should send an email or just uh, log the email sending. So this is this, this is uh, this function starts smaller and become bigger. So we can, you know, ask some questions, ask ourselves, is it this function, you know, good, you know, the way it is? Is that something that we can do to make it readable, to make it humanic, and make easier the task of the people who will have to read those codes some, some days? So we ask ourselves, it's for good, but, you know, since we are talking about a little monster, our little monster said that this function wasn't good enough. Was it good enough? Why? Because people need to go through this code to understand what is going on. So people can fix some issues in order to understand what is going on in each step of the code and each flow. So he want that, he want the code, uh, the function to be as small as possible and readable possible. So people will be, it will be easy for the people to understand him because the language he used to talk to people is the code. So the first thing we decided to do is to just took away the, those two flows we had in our office, you know, extra, uh, if uh, to extract them in a function. So we have one function for no operation uh, activity and another one for sending the email and persisting. So we end up with this version of the function, but we still ask, ask ourselves, is that something that we can do in order to make this function look better? Something that we can do to make it more idiomatic? So, then we think about, we remember about uh, death penalty. Can you switch this slide, please? Yes, sorry, I think that I'm not taking, uh, paying attention to the slides. So, uh, so we decided to use the death penalty, which is a way to have polymorphism behavior in closure. So here, the, the death penalty take a conditional, and we decide we implemented two, two functions. We can implement it as much function as you want, since it, it depends on the different case we'll have to, to implement. So here you want one case for a no operation and another one for sending the email and process it also. So now we just have to call the def multi function, passing some information to it, and the condition will be evaluated, and according to that, one or another function will be called. So now we have this version of our function. We start with that bigger one you can see in the bigger box, that uh, function in the bigger box, and we end up with that small one in the smaller box. So now, if somebody has to go through this code, it's easier for him to understand because we have some piece of little function 
easier to easier to go through and also readable and just uh, seeing just look watching uh, seeing the name and uh, going through this function you will be able to understand what's going on our little monster is happy because people understand him now and he will think twice before to start spreading the cross in the planet now talk about a new case of testing and schemas. This is based on real facts. So we had this very small function that's responsible for rendering an HTML template based on some, some variables it receives. But we received a book call saying that the interpolation wasn't working in some cases. But how could we start understanding what it, what is happening? It has no unit tests. We don't know what this Ismail argument is. We, the only thing we know, maybe by looking at the same partial documentation, is that it receives a map with keys and variables to be interpolated. How could we investigate better? So we recur to the most advanced debug tool ever, approach while running the integration tests, mm -hmm. and we could see that the email payload has this text, vars, and array of contents and names. So we just take this payload, send to the function, we, we can see that the return is in fact a map with keys and values to be interpolated. But what could be going wrong? If we look closely at the templates, the customer name and the dates are with underscores, while in the keys they have dashes. It happens, we can fix this by calling our dash to, to underscore function, but what could have prevented us from facing this bug? The answer is, it could have been, just the, since the beginning, a unit test. Here is an example with a, of a test using the media framework. We just call the function passing an input and declare the expected output. Since it's, since it's a pure function, every time we send the same input, the output should also be the same. So this test should always pass. But what could still have made us to investigate that bug faster and understand what was going on by just looking at the code? The answer is schemas. Schemas are a way of declaring how is the data flowing through your code structure. I mean, is it a string? Is it, is it an integer? Is it a map of strings and integers? I don't know. You decide. But since closure is not a typed, typed language, it's very difficult to understand code that we can see what's the input and the output, especially when we have some complex functions and with a lot of business rules. It's very, very difficult to understand what that function is doing if you can see what's flowing through it. So that's why I use a lot of schemas here at the back. And here is how we declare uh, schemas in a function. We call the defun from the schema core, the S namespace, and we declare the output, in this case the range of ours, repair on the underscores on the keys, and we declare the schemas for, for each argument, in this case the email. So now we can just look at the code and understand what's flowing through it. Also, a very nice feature about schema is this macro with FN validation, because it makes all the functions that are called inside it throw errors if the data they receive a return are not compliant with the schemas declared. So we use it to wrap up our unity and integration tests, and it helps us to, uh, us a lot to, to catch bugs like the fields that's new and it shouldn't be new. So we, it's really nice tip, use it, uh, is it nice. And a little monster is happy. So now the second case I'll like to share with you is about coupling in, in the code. Uh, at the beginning, our notification service had only one provider. I mean, Nubank was small and only one provider just fit the need of Nubank. Also, we needed to save some money. So it's starting small and you need to fight with the tools you have in your hands. So, but someday that provider goes down. And we run into trouble because we needed to send some. We needed to send our emails, and uh, the, our provider was down, and we needed to find out a way to do that to send our email. Then we decided to just implement a new provider. So when we start that tech, we actually we implement that in one day, and then we faced some issues when we were doing that. It was it wasn't so easy that, uh, that so easy to change our providers we encountered some issues. Some of them was copying the database. I mean, our schemas in the database, the domain had the name of that provider. So it's kind of, it was just only ready for that. Our implementation logic also was coupled to that providers. Means how we should send the email, all those stuff were tightly related to that provider. Our schemas, the name of our schemas, how they were 
uh, they shape uh, they shape everything where according to that pro results. So, to resume, all our implementation of sending email through the provider were highly complex, and we needed to do something because uh, our little muscle was very angry with that. So, since we went through the harder, harder task to implement the new providers and we saw the, the difficulty we faces, we decided to fix that. And we, we decided to use the component from Stewart Share. So, which is the way for us to make only one component uh, aware of how something should, do, should be done. So, our email component, uh, our email sender component now is the only one who is aware of how an email should be sent or not. I mean, you know about the providers and you just call the, this, the, this component, send to him, uh, giving, giving to him what you want to be sent, and you will choose between those, between those providers how to send those emails. So, I mean, now, if one provider goes down, we can just switch all our traffic to the second one, or if you want, you can, you want uh, some more providers, we can just implement the, the client side of that provider and just plug into the component we're using now. And now we're good. The remote is happy because it can change the way it behaves as much as it wants. You know? It's not, it's much more, uh, much less painful now. Now talking about some architectural improvements, we made a notification. This is how it used to work in the past. It has this bunch of namespaces called registries. And each registry contains some events related to sending communication to our customers. For example, if you look at the first one, the Boleto registry, it had the new Boleto event. And inside of this event, it declared the template of email related to this event and a function, the should send function, that says if that template should be sent or not. Also, all the templates declared by, by the events were in the source code. We have the resources folder with all the HTML templates of emails. And also we had a bunch of Kafka topics, each one related to a different kind of event. So how it use it to work? Suppose I want to send a new Boleto event to a customer. Then my Boleto service would produce to this Kafka topic a new Boleto and notification would consume from this topic. When consuming from this topic, it will do some closure metaprogramming by listing all of its namespaces, then filtering the ones with con which contain the registry in their meta constants, and then in each one, it would iterate until it finds the one that contains the new Boleto event. In this case, the Boleto registry. This is all the information notification we will need, because now it will evolve the should send function, and if it's true, it would gather the template, the HTML template, and then it would send to the email provider. This approach used to work very well, but it started showing some problems. Like, at the beginning, the banking was very small. It didn't have that, that much kind of communication to send to the customers. But as it grew, a lot more emails were, were appearing. So we, we ended up with a service which was responsible for defining whether each kind of communication should be sent or not. It doesn't matter if it's a credit card communication or acquisition communication or a no contact communication. It's just too much for just a single service to handle. Also, it was hard to debug because of this. Because people would tell us, oh, my email is not being sent. But we don't know what the business rules apply to this email not being sent. We don't even have that clear in the logs which registry and which events are being used. So it was very difficult to understand what was going on in case by case when web communication were not being sent. Also imagine for every time you wanted to fix a typo on one template or add a new sentence or add a new template, you would have to wait through until the service passed to the whole deployment pipeline until it achieved production to be able to use these templates. Our pipelines are much faster now, but they were not so much in the past, so it was a really painful situation waiting for our changes in the templates to propagate into production. And finally, we have some automations that scrap is closure repos from our GitHub, but as it's happening, notification has so many HTML files that GitHub thinks as an HTML repo. Ahaha. So automations were broken because of this. Now, this is the new architecture of notification. It was not started by us. It was made before. Uh, we adapted notification, but we are in the process of migrating the last emails to this new, to this new architecture. And this is how it works. Now we have a separated template repository where everyone can write their templates there. 
And all this repository does through its pipeline is just uploading those templates to S3. Notification was tricky to have just a single Kafka topic that is delivery mail, which receives the template it should send. So which will get this, those, this template from S3 and send to the provider, just that. All the logic of where those, those emails should be sent or not are now delegated to business services. We have a bunch of them, I believe one for each business area, like no content credit card. And those services are the ones responsible, they are in the right domain for deciding the business rules of which if that communication should be sent. And if it should, they will just produce to this Kafka topic and that's all, that's how it works. Now, every squad has all the, the context of dealing with this kind of decisions. And our monster is happy with this change. So now I'm talking about flexibility in our operational. So, I mean, back again with my provider example. Here you can see the big picture of how we send out an email. I mean, our we have services. We will publish some records in our in notification service Kafka, and from there notification will take those records, prepare them, and send them like uh, as email to uh, our providers, provider one or provider two. So, but again, our provider the same I talked before, you know, goes down again. And we needed to 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 take them some decision. And since we have two providers now, though it was you know, kind of easy to just uh, control the situation to keep it that under control, we decided to switch all our traffic to the second provider. And we say, maybe we're good now. Then we remember that it wasn't only what you had to do because we've uh, some uh, some of our record in the Kafka topic uh, partition have been already processed by the providers one and they are in the backlog of the of, of the provider ones and we want them to be sent again because they were transactional emails and so we needed to send them as soon as possible so what we decided to do is what can we do the solution came up to us is we can just switch back the, the kafka offset and we'll be good the second provider will just reprocess those record provider email and send them to the second provider and everything's okay then that should be uh, that, that 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 should be the, the 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 happy happy part. But then we realized that the one who was supposed to help us to prevent us from sending email uh, or processing stuff twice, you know, become our enemy, become the problem we had to face. The idiopotency become the problem. So how we came up? Uh, what, what is the solution we came up with? Uh, this kind of issues because I mean, idiopotency is not a bad thing, it's a good thing, but we want to be able to control the way the idiopotency is applied or not. We want to be flexible in operation because we never know how things are going to uh, go wrong and what you will have to be to, to do in order to bring back stuff uh, under, under control. So, you want to be able to confide to you. We decided to make the idiopotency checking configurable. So now we just have a flag in our config file because every service has a config file. And in that config file, you can just switch on or off you know, the checking of the idiopotency. And the only thing you have to do in order to make that change available for all the, for, for, for all the services, instances, all the instances of the service in uh, in the de deployed, you can you, you just have to. And we have some operational operational endpoint. You just have to hit that operational endpoint, and it will take care of updating the, the config of all those instances were running, and we good. So now, if we we need to send an email, some checking will be done. And if you saw that oh, this email already have been sent, it, it, I mean it's already in the in the database. It's going to change the idiopotency. See, can I send this email or not? If the idiopotency, idiopotency is, uh, is set for true, then it's wrong. But if it's set to false, then it will send that email. So now our little monster can again you know, decide the way it's going to behave in production the way it wants. So this is much more easier and it's happy now. Documentation is some controversial point because there are people who love it, people who hate it, but it has its uses, and we are going to show you how you use it. 
Of course, code and tests are always the best documentation because they reflect the most recent state of that system. I mean, if it's in the code, that's how the system is working, right? And if we need to change it, the test will break, so we need to update the test as well. So they will never get stale. But, of course, they have to be readable and idiomatic, so that's why code reveals and such things are important. Asking for feedbacks about your code. And we also, some parts of the code that can get stale is comments. So if you need a comment on your function, if you update that function later, please remember to update those comments, because, yeah, they get stale, unlike the code. But code explains how that system is working at that moment, but it doesn't explain the why it worked that way. So it was not uncommon for us to face some situation where we questioned some architectural decision of our service, but when we did some archaeology, we discovered that what, what we thought was better was actually trying the past and didn't work for some reason, because people haven't done this. But why have they done this? What's happened? Why is it working this way and not that? So what we're doing to try to mitigate this is using ADRs, that are architectural decision records, AGRs is a kind of document that doesn't get stale because there we just write a little paragraph explaining why those decisions were taken, how we have implemented those decisions, and finally we, we add the people involved on those decisions and a date, the date that that decision was, was taken. So whenever we need to change that decision to implement a new one, we will not update this document but create a new document with a new date on why we haven't done that decision. So this way we have a set of records that people can look at it and understand everything that was made on that service and these are what people from commit the same mistake twice. Also, when understanding a service, it is just a small part of a huge network of microservices. It's just a small part of a whole flow. So when dealing with a flow, it's nice to have some diagrams on how services communicate with each other. So people new to that flow can have this broader vision and just pinpoint that service they need to change on that part of the flow and dig deeper on that part. They will know exactly how this affects the whole flow. And finally, we work a lot in mobs and pairs because we don't want a hero. That hero that is the one that knows everything that's going on, on with our services. We need everyone to be contextualized of our decisions and our changes so we can act together and make our services better. So, chapter three, rolling out and monitoring. Now I want to talk about rollouts. Rollout is our damage control strategy. I mean, we use that to control to keep the, uh, stuff under control. Since we are dealing with uh, abandoned uh, services, we want to take care of them. I mean, those services are already on production. They are running and the problem they have, people are already aware of that and they know how to deal with them. But our, our job will, will be, uh, will be uh, changed bring some changes to the, to, to the code base of those leader monsters, you know, uh, improve some, 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 some functions, improve some features, and also implement some new stuff, implement some new, new features. And you want to be able to control the way those features or those changes are going to uh, be released and also be able to react uh, quickly if stuff uh, goes wrong. So, how we do that? We do that by the use of the rollout components. In the rollout components, uh, roughly, basically, what you have to do is you have to declare some keys, and those keys are mapped to some files in the, I mean, our S3, where the rules uh, of the rollout you know, uh, lens. So, kind of so when when you uh, the, when you want to use the rollout, you know. The rollout file will look like something like that. You, know, you have some rules that are declared here. Here you can see that we are saying that for this, uh, the feature for, 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 for which this rollout will be used, you will be saying that I want 20%, for example, let's say we're talking about customers, I want 20% of our customers to be uh, aware of this future, I want this future to be enabled for 20% of, of those customers, and also I want the customer one, two, three to be among those 20% of customers. So this is a way, a way for you to control the way you're going to release those changes or those mm, those features. The snippet code, you know, at the bottom just show the the use of the of the rollouts. So it just show. 
No problem. It's not a problem. I can no no no. Go, go to, the, to the next one. I can just I can just talk about it in the next one also. No problem. So this second uh, this is a second example of of rollout. In this one, we just decide you know, we use a personal personal strategy where we want to send eighty percent of our traffic to the provider one, and we we'll send twenty percent of our traffic to the provider two. So this is a very handy way to control this, the way we send the email to uh, our providers. Like I showed you before in the example, when some provider goes down, this is the way that we control, uh, we keep things under control. We just switch all our traffic to one, the provider who is still up and we go. So uh, in the sniper code, you can see that in the you take the raw component, you pass to him some in uh, some arguments, and according to those arguments, it's going to perform some, some checking based on those rules you de uh, we defined before, that you can see in the, in the box outside, uh, uh, above, and then it will show, it will choose which path to follow, if it will send the email with the provider once or two. So, so good, so, so far, so good. So, that's all. Rollouts are damage control tools, but we need to know if damages is being taken. So, this is why monitoring jumps in. So we inherited some alerts and metrics from the old owners of our services, our, our monsters. But in our journey, we faced a lot of new problems. So for every new problem we faced, afterwards we did alerts and metrics that would have prevented them from happening or would have alerted us faster. So that's why we always try to keep them up to date. But alerts saying that your service is topping 100% CPU. Like, what does it mean? How are our customers being affected by this? So that's why it's important to have alerts that represent real business metrics. So in your, the case of notification, it could be like, yeah, the emails are not being sent, or the error to send mails is in a high hitch. So we could just look at the alerts and understand what's happening and the criticity of the problem. Also, logs are important when dealing with those strange edge cases that always happen. So we log everything from our services. Since you, from when it takes some decision to when it communicates to the, to the external world, we always try to log everything. So we have a record of uh, all the tracking of how that the customer flowed through our service and we can identify the problems that happen with those flows. And also, whenever we are starting a new task now, we ask ourselves if we have enough metrics to understand if they will work or not. I mean, we are dealing with backlog that has a lot of damage control tasks. So everything we can do to the service could make things actually worse. So that's why we have to, to understand if you are making things worse or improving them. So that's why we need metrics. And if we don't have enough metrics to understand a task, we have the task of creating those metrics and then we go back to the actual task of doing the improvement we need to do. Chapter four, the final. So, Lesson that we gather from those adoption uh, process are the following. We want everybody in our squad in, uh, to be aware of what we are, we are doing. We need a lot of heroes, people that will be able to take care to, to give a quick response if things go wrong. So you don't want only one hero, you know, the one will be able to solve some kind of issues. And when dealing with code bases that are not written by you or our old code bases, is that totally normal? People will ask you questions and you don't know how to answer. It's fine. Everything will be all right. You understand everything eventually. So keep calm. Test. Maybe we'll say that here at Nubank, you know, testing is a is a is a is a strong culture. But I think it's good to still talk about that because you need you need test. There are the documentation who are going to, you know, you know, be updated with your codes. You there will there will be good documentation for people to understand why you did it, how things work, but also they will prevent you to send some bugs in production. So you can you have to use them a lot. It's very difficult to exist that, that task of refactoring code poorly. So refactoring should be an habit. When you are doing your regular task, ask yourself if, if that code is good or not. It doesn't matter if it was you who made it. So, so the code keeps always up to date and readable for everyone who needs to use it. Documentation, I would like to 
Uh, emphasis on the ADRs one is very important. Since there's uh, the kind of documentation we will be one for our code, we want to be able also to keep record of our uh, architectural decisions. So you need ADRs to be able to understand why people took some kind of decision and why they didn't do stuff in the other way. So how you need that. And when dealing with code that's already in production and used by a lot of people, you just can't change things like so fast. So rollout strategies are your friends. Alex and metrics. I mean, Alex and metrics are, they are the, the main way you have to be aware of the current state of your application. I mean, if your application is going well or not, your leader months are good or not, your metrics are the ones going to give you that quick feedback. So what you want is to be able to, want to ask yourself if, the, if you can really on those information, on those alerts. And the way to be able to, to, to answer those questions is keep asking, to keep looking at your business, seeing if you have better data to give you better alert and metrics information or not. You have always to think about updating them. And finally, when we are in a, we are writing code, we think about writing a book. We are not just writing for yourselves, but for the others to read as well. So ask for feedbacks. Think about the future and think about the others who deal with it. And this is us now living happily with our monsters that are much more stable since there are people who generally care about them and are giving them attention to improve them. Of course, sometimes some of them can misbehave. It happens there is no perfect service or perfect monster, but we are here to help bring them to normality again. And none of this would be possible without this whole team behind us. So thank you guys, you are all amazing. And this is the end, thank you very much. Thank you very much.